Thank you very much for, for inviting me uh, and, and having me. Um, this is a little bit different for me in a way because I do deliver a lot of training and I speak at a lot of conferences, but the vast majority of my audiences are professionals, parents um, and uh, neurotypical people. Um, and although I've done some groups and it, it's, I think this is probably the, the first time and the largest uh, group of my peers that I'm talking to, which is probably scarier than usual, to be honest, um, because we're all so different uh, and I don't know if I have anything to tell you because you're living the same life as I'm living uh, and whereas professionals um, think that, that, that just knowing how we live is, uh, is you know, uh, inspirational sometimes some of the, the, the things that, that they, they feel I guess for us it's just life um, and so I, I hope I have something useful to, to, to say to you um, if, if you could um, I'm going to leave some time at the end for us to have a, a bit of a discussion a chat share some ideas if, if you could wait for that time that would really help me um, because I have structure and a schedule and a plan, uh, and, and I'm not great at going off in a tangent. Um, so uh, you, of all people, should have empathy uh, around that. Uh, so so please, please be kind to me. Um, uh, the, um, what I want to talk about today is a little bit is about my life, my experience of being diagnosed, um, hopefully just as, as a means of sharing that. And I know a lot of you belong to SWAN and you have those opportunities to share. Um, and then I, I thought, um, you yeah, know, Catriona said this is about being practical. This is about, uh, you know, not theory. So, so I've brought a little show and tell of my favorite objects. Uh, that actually make my life better and easier. Um, so, I'm, you know, sometimes we talk about strategies and approaches and they're all a bit woolly and a bit vague. Um, but I sat down and thought, actually, what do I do? Because, you know, if you're living this life, you don't always know what you do that might be a little bit different or a little bit m uh, more necessary. Um, and so I've really kind of tried to kind of examine. Some of these things won't won't perhaps be, be useful to you, but, but hopefully just to kind of think about them. Uh, and also some things that I've learned. Um, you know, I'm 49. I was diagnosed not, not a huge amount of time uh, ago. Uh, but, but, you know, we're battle scarred, some of us old. I, I kind of often describe the late diagnosed autistic population as feral. That we, we've kind of made our own way through, we're a bit knocked about, we've got one eye, the, you know, the ear's kind of falling off and we're staggering a little bit, we're a bit twitchy here and there, but, but actually we're here and, and we did it and nobody helped and nobody gave a diagnosis and there was no support whatsoever. Uh, and I think that's a huge testament to, to an older generation that can kind of look back and, 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 and share with, with younger people. Actually, really, that doesn't matter. You know that thing you think that everybody cares about? They don't. So you just ditch that. And if somebody had told me some of those things 20 years ago, God, my life would have been so much easier. Um, but we've kind of had to sort of struggle along and work those things out for ourselves. Uh, and I hope when we have some time to kind of talk together uh, at the end of me doing my talky bit, that, that you may have some of those things that you can teach me because I'm still uh, learning as much as uh, anybody else is. So let me let me begin by uh, introducing myself. Um, I'm the one on the, on the right, <laughs> left. I don't know if that's the right or the left. Um, it's a little hobby my partner and I have that we like to <coughs> copy statues. We have no friends. What do you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, by the time I was diagnosed, um, I had uh, already had a master's degree in autism. I had published six books, delivered over a thousand trainee events. I was a manager of an autism mentoring project for seven years. Uh, my partner's autistic, my son's autistic, uh, my mother undoubtedly was autistic. A number of my nieces and nephews have all had diagnoses. Um, and as you, many of you will all know, the reason it took so long is because I'm a girl. Um, and I'm old. Um, and I'm clever. So all of those things meant that actually I don't look very autistic. Um, and I know that I don't look very autistic because barely a day goes by in my working life where someone doesn't tell me that I don't look very autistic. <laughs> Does anybody else have this experience when they try to tell people? Um, I, I carry out a, a sort of non-clinical diagnostic assessments uh, and, I, and I, I do this on a lot of adult women and, and at the end of the assessment we talk about how they're going to share this information with their families and I have to say to them, most people won't believe you and you need to deal with that and you need to find an answer 
which doesn't mean that you end up justifying, yeah, but I'm anxious, yeah, but I do this, yeah, but I do this. You don't have to tell people that, but you've got to find a way to deal with that question. When somebody who has absolutely no knowledge and training in autism knows better than the person who diagnosed you. That essentially, to me, is that what that says. You don't look, you can't be autistic. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had a PhD in autism. I thought you were... Just my friend. Drives me insane. I hate it. So find a good answer uh, for uh, the not, you don't look very autistic question. Uh, So I was a bit of a strange child. I apparently spoke full sentences at the age of nine months old. I was kind of a female Stewie, if anybody watches Family Guy. Um, um, Considered shy, neurotic in my own little world. I was called Sarah Snail because I was always dreaming and and wandering around somewhere Um, considered to be very clever and I think there's a tendency that if you're very clever that everybody thinks life is going to be fine because you're clever if you're clever you can do anything I came from a a working class family from a council estate and and my mother particularly undoubtedly on the autistic spectrum was very much of the opinion that being clever saved you it meant you could be successful it meant everything could could be kind, kind of fine um, I was a tomboy. Uh, I liked. Um, um, I wanted to be a Harrier jump jet pilot, but they didn't allow women to be RAF pilots at that time. Um, I, I liked making things out of woodwork and, and cars. I was very much a, a daddy's a daddy's girl, and I liked organising things, uh, sorting things out, uh, and um, words were very much my my thing. Uh, by the age of twelve, uh, I learned about lobotomies. <laughs> And I thought that they sounded pretty fine. (laughs) That having a lobotomy sounded like a really peaceful life because I didn't feel there was any peace in my life. My head just span and span and span with thoughts and ideas and questions and analysis and and it felt very, very difficult. Uh, In my house, we used to read the Daily Mirror. Um, and I remember reading that the average age of a reader of the daily, the average reading age of a Daily Mirror reader was something like 12 years of age. That, that was the level of vocabulary that was required to read that, that kind, of, kind of newspaper. And I thought that would be wonderful to believe everything that you read in the Daily Mirror and that be it to not question, to not analyse, that you just accepted life, that there were these millions of people out there in the world who just accepted life that they saw in the Daily Mirror. And at the age of 12, I thought that was a wonderful idea, that that, that would be possible, because for me, that, that really didn't feel how, how, life, how life was. Uh, I had one bossy friend of a, at, a, at a time. Um, we'll see a picture of my bossy friend in a, in a, in a second. Um, I got into my middle years, this is me as a mum with my baby at the age of 19, the look of terror on my face. Um, I'm now scared because she's 30 uh, and she's taller than me, so I can no longer beat her in a fight. (laughs) Uh, And there's a point in your children's life, if you're a parent, that you realise you can no longer beat them in a fight. Uh, and your whole power balance shifted. That happened about 14 with my daughter. She, she was quite a, a... I found parenting very, very, very difficult. Um, I remember being on the other side of a bedroom door. I think she was pushing and I was pushing. I was trying to get in. She was trying to stop me. And I realised that she was stronger than me. And that was it. I was finished. But I never told her. <laughs> So teenage years, are, you know, I'm this, this, this gifted child. Everybody has these massively high expectations of what my life would be like. Um, I very much wanted to fit in. Uh, I copied people. I, I still have a very terrible tendency to pick up accents very, very easily um, wherever I go, which is difficult. Um, I am doing very well by not speaking in a very poor Glaswegian accent today, so uh, so I need credit for that, definitely. Um, I, I was very naive and very vulnerable. Uh, I ended up in a lot of problems in terms of relationships or with men um, because I just wanted to have a sign that I was acceptable. Um, so I pretty much went anywhere with anyone who I thought that meant they liked me. Uh, little did I realise it just meant 
I said yes. That was all that was happening for, for them. Um, so constantly confused, constantly vulnerable, constantly in, in danger um, of harm and assault, uh, and, and those things happened uh, on, on occasion. My educational achievement turned out to be pretty mediocre. I never got an A, I just got a whole bunch of Bs and a few Cs, I did okay, um, but constantly being told that I was a disappointment educationally, that I was lazy, that I was careless, I didn't know what else there was I was supposed to be doing. I, I just turned up and I did stuff and went away again. The, the kind of concept of a career or a future or any of that just absolutely meant, meant nothing whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, by the time I was 17, I was drinking half a bottle of gin a day um, and uh, just using that to kind of self-medicate. Had I not got pregnant by an almost stranger at the age of 18, I'd undoubtedly be drunk in a ditch by now. So actually, being pregnant saved my life. It gets better. This is all a bit depressing, isn't it? But it's fine. Hey, I'm here. Woo! Um, and actually, I think that saved my life, and I often felt that, that, that the, the role of parenting, although I found it very hard, it gave me a structure. To me, being a parent had a very strict set of rules. You didn't get drunk, you had to do the best you could, you, you became this absolute model parent. And that's what I did. I, I absolutely just dedicated myself to being the most perfect possible parent. Obviously, I failed, because every parent does, um, but you know, ultimately, that, that completely saved my life. I've had over 35 jobs, I'm completely unemployable. Um, I, I've never been fired, but I have walked out of many jobs on a point of very small principle. That I, and some of you again can identify with that. I cannot work here a moment longer. <laughs> And off I would stride in my diva-like fashion because their policies weren't up to my liking or somebody had stolen a piece of my work and not given me the credit I needed. Um, and off I went into poverty, into all sorts of uh, even worse jobs sometimes. Um, often just not really being able to work out what I would be good at. Because I was clever, therefore I can do anything, can't I? No, I can't. And, and I think that's been a kind of big lesson and it's something that I, I kind of always try and share, that being clever doesn't protect you. It doesn't protect you if you don't have the social stuff. It doesn't protect you if you're not flexible enough to kind of manage in, in lots of different workplaces. Um, I think we're square pegs and we need square holes. Um, and I've been lucky enough to find a square hole. In fact, I dug my own square hole because I, I kind of couldn't find one. So lifelong anxiety, self-harm, stress, obsessions, exhaustion, lots of physical, mental um, health issues uh, along the way. Uh, headaches are just, if I haven't got a headache, it's the best day of the year as far as I'm concerned. It's so, so rare for me not to have a headache. Uh, migraines as well, which I, I differentiate from other headaches. I have tinnitus, I have vertigo, um, I have enormous sensitivities to foods and chemicals and lights and lack of light and air conditioning and air fresheners and all of those sorts of things. I'm the person that if I came round to your house and you use plugins, I'll go round and find them and pull them out without telling you. And then when I leave, you'll wonder why all your plugins are on the floor. Um, I do that at my mother-in-law's house. Don't tell her. <laughs> Blame the cat. That's what we'll do. Socially, I was always jolly. This is one of my friends, Amanda. Um, we were at Brownies together. Uh, Amanda uh, and I lost contact after, after uh, uh, primary school um, and found each other again on Facebook about 25, 30 years later. Amanda is head of an autism unit in a school. So Amanda found her vocation early, looking after me. Um, <laughs> uh, either Amanda's autistic as well, or she just liked it so much that she carried on for the rest of her life. Um, I've always preferred boys. Uh, girls are much too complex. Uh, I often say that, that women are just the most frightening people in the world to me, neurotypical women. Um, and I remember saying this at a conference with Dr. Judith Gould, who some of you will know worked with Lorna Wing. Uh, she, she's very very, um, very much an expert in, in female autism. Uh, and she came up after the conference and, and she said to me, touching me, you know how women do? They're constantly touching you here. Um, Sarah, what is it that we do that upsets you so much? <laughs> and I said it just feels like a tsunami, like a wave of loveliness, a wave of emotion. And it's not bad, it's not bad. She's a wonderful, warm and, and empathic and generally lovely person. 
but it just makes me want to back into a corner because it kind of feels like it's overwhelming uh, and approaching me. So anybody like that is not going to be my friend. A, because I can't bear them, and B, because they can't bear me. Uh, and I think you know, that's something we'll talk about in a little while. Uh, is uh, I'm sorry, I've been too loud for the baby. Sorry. Um, so socially, I, again, I'm, I met somebody that I used to be at school with and who obviously didn't know anything about me being autistic, and, and she said, but you were always so jolly. And, and I think that that's... That has always been my strategy, is to be jolly. Um, uh, I'm half autistic and half scouse. My dad is a, is a Liverpudlian, um, known for this phenomenal, biting sense of humour. And that's kind of what I've grown up with, that, that humour protects you. Humour saves you. It gives you something to say when you've got nothing else to say. If you're good with words and you're quick-brained, then often you can make people laugh. And making people laugh gives you a little bit of buy-in for a little while if you can't do the small talk if you can't do the other stuff and that's very much been a, a subconscious strategy uh, is, is to make people laugh and then they'll like me for a while. Unfortunately it doesn't have any real depth to it so after you've kept making people laugh they just get annoyed with you in the end um, and then they realise maybe there's nothing else there or you don't have any depth to that relationship so it's a good way in it, it kind, of, kind of keeps people um, you know, interested for, for a little while. Unfortunately, it also fools people sometimes into thinking that you're much more gregarious than you actually are. Um, I, I did a conference presentation in, in America and a lady came up and she said, oh, I wish you lived here. We could hang out. You're so much fun. And I just said, you'd be really disappointed. <laughs> I think people think that whatever, you know, and I'm sure many of us know about putting on personas and fronts and those sorts of things. Um, and it's not false and it's not fake. It's, it's just a uniform to, to, to work in a situation to deliver what's needed to be delivered uh, and, and, you know, and, and do, do what, 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 what needs to be done. Um, I was bullied a lot. I, was always, I got into trouble quite a lot. I was very easily led. If anyone said something was a good idea, I just said I was a yes person. Uh, I have a kind of theory that autistic people are often split into yes people and no people, so that when something new is suggested, there are some autistic people that just say no. I can't imagine what that will be like, I can't map it, I can't contextualise it, so I will say no. And those people often have quite small lives, they don't do a great deal, they keep themselves safe in this quite small world. I think there are other autistic people who are yes people, and those are people where things are suggested to them, they equally can't map it accurately, they can't risk assess, they can't work out what's properly involved, but instead of that being a good thing, that actually gives you, you don't know why you should say no, therefore you say yes. And I think a lot of women are often yes people uh, in, in autism. And so we go, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I could do that. I can go there. I can do that job. I can do that thing. We want to fit in. We want to show that we're capable. We don't want to look weak. And the yes people often get into a lot more trouble and a lot more danger. Uh, one of the reasons I realised that I was autistic was being at a conference and, and hearing a woman speak. Um, she was a Dutch woman. Her name's Vingarden Clemmers, uh, a surname. Um, and she was talking about a substance misuse clinic that she worked in um, and that she realised that quite a lot of the people coming through were possibly on the autistic spectrum and she started to screen them. And she realised that the women were having more life events than the men, that the men had this much more traditional autistic profile, often of being quite small lives, and, but the women had multiple jobs, multiple relationships, multiple crises because they were saying yes to things that other people would have said no to, because other people would have been more accurately assessing that. So when we talk about social imagination in, in, in autism, which, which kind of means that kind of bigger picture, contextual thinking, consequences, it seems to be the case that it's not just about not having enough, it's about whether you have too much or whether you're using it accurately. And, and that, that's the difference. So in autism, it's not just people who say no, it's people who say yes and get into trouble. And I was very much one of those people. And, and my experience suggests that, that women are more prone to be those, those kind of people. Um, so desperately wanting to fit in and so saying yes to everything and getting into a lot of trouble. Um, emotional stuff, I think uh, one of the big learnings for me is this thing called alexithymia that some of you will be aware of, this concept of not really knowing how you feel. Um, and in the, it's only been in the last couple 
couple of years that I've realised that I really feel very little in between extremes. I don't know when I'm hungry, I don't know when I'm tired, I don't know many, many things about myself. Um, I have to go back and work out what I've been doing in the last 24 hours to determine whether I might be feeling something based on the evidence of, of, you know, if I've been working for five days straight, then it might be the case that the reason that I'm crying is because I'm tired. I don't have that immediate connection, the language, the feeling. I have to go and work it out whether that might be what's happening. Um, and that's really hard. And I think I, I feel that that's quite a, quite a, big, a big deal. So lots of self-harm, uh, lots of suicidal thoughts uh, all, all along the way. They're, they're almost a daily occurrence um, on, a, on a kind of general sort of low, low level. So then got this diagnosis in my 40s after working in this field for a long time. It took me a long time to get it because I thought I was just sort of projecting from all these people I was working with. Um, and then once I got it, I didn't tell anybody for about two years because I was kind of fearful of what that meant. I knew how difficult it had been for other people uh, and I was, I was frightened of doing so. But actually sharing it has probably been the best thing I've ever done. Uh, it's been incredibly liberating um, and unhelpful I think that that and I think some some of us have got to do it you, you you've got you've got to tell people because otherwise nothing changes and I know that's not the job for everybody um, but if you have the ability to have a voice then I think it's it's our duty to some degree to, to share all of that uh, so all of that kind of explained things and it was huge and it was a relief and, and that's very much my experience for most people that it's it's a huge huge thing to have that diagnosis um, I know now that I am right about everything <laughs> and that's fine and that I have no file whatsoever for handbags anyone asked me oh I've got a new handbag <laughs> does it have pockets <laughs> it's, it's a handbag does it carry things can you fit sandwiches in it <laughs> just not there whatsoever but it's surprising and I'm sure some of you will realise and know that those small things at times in your life can make you feel like the crappiest woman in the world because you just don't know about these sorts of things or how it works. I remember being taken round boots to choose some makeup. Now and again, I have in the past, I've given up this now, I've had phases of trying to be a normal woman. Has anyone else done this? Well, you go, right, I'm going to buy clothes. I'm going to brush my hair and I'm going to wear makeup. I don't know anything about makeup. I don't know what to do. It's almost like a, a gene was missing for me in, in the makeup. I did sort of punk makeup and had Mohicans and pink hair and all that kind of stuff, but kind of ordinary makeup, absolutely no way. So I remember once being trotted round boots by a, a, friend, a friend of mine with my basket, looking like sort of some sort of care in the community kind of person. <laughs> well, you'll need some of this. What does it do? <laughs> you'll need some of What does it do? It made my skin feel horrible. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it just sat there. I probably paid about 50 quid. It sat there and sell-by date went and it went in the bin. That was the, the end of that. Yeah, don't bother. That's my general advice. So now I have an autistic life and, and it's been a, a massive liberation. That's not to say that everything's easy, but certainly it's easier than it was. Um, and this is my partner, Keith. Um, he's a Burke. Uh, he's also autistic, which is hugely helpful, um, and he, I, my life wouldn't be uh, not what it is without him. He, he's, uh, he's incredibly, incredibly important to me on, on lots of ways. What the diagnosis did for me was allow me to forensically, which I continue to do, break down every element of my life and work out what goes wrong, why it goes wrong, and how can we make it better, um, and pick it to pieces constantly which can be a little bit obsessive, but, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, the benefits of that are that my mental health is a lot better often than it, than it has been, that I achieve a lot more, that, that I'm successful to a, same, a certain degree, um, and I live a life which actually suits me whilst meeting the obligations of my family, of my work, and all of those kind of things. It's a juggle, the same as it would be for anybody. 
but life is very much uh, for me about being an autistic life and it, and it really is so the, the more I try to live non-autistically the more unwell I am physically, mentally, stress uh, physical uh, ailments and, and those kind, <coughs> kinds of things I have a very low arousal life wherever possible um, the job that I do kind of suits me um, um, I'm self-employed I'm the only person that can tolerate working with me um, after my 35 jobs I know that sometimes I see jobs in the paper and I think oh I could do that I'm going to apply and then I think no <laughs> it wouldn't work <laughs> you just tell them how to run the company within your first week um, that's, that's not okay um, I'm also kind of aware that there's this sort of scaffolding which holds up what I have to do um, and my job's sort of relatively public kind of do, doing things like this um, and I love goats I look a bit like them sometimes um, I have very limited social contacts. Um, weirdly, most of my friends are autistic. They weren't when I met them, um, and I wasn't when I met them. Well, we were, but we didn't have diagnoses. They didn't become autistic just because they hang out with me. That's not really how it works. Um, uh, they, they've all actually had diagnoses completely independently. Um, so, and, and I know some people, uh, you know, I had a parent the other day say, well, I don't want my child to live in a ghetto and only hang out with autistic people. And I was thinking, yeah, but they will anyway, that, that quite often we're attracted to people who are relatively similar. That, that, and that makes sense to me. Everybody is. If, if you're a very gregarious, very intuitively social person, then the chances are that you're, you're going to have your needs met by people who are relatively similar. Um, so my, my, my friends are, are very similar to me. Um, my contact with them is very infrequent um, and tends to be uh, activity based we just go for a, watch a film or eat cake and then go home it lasts about an hour and a half and then we go our separate ways and then we don't see each other or speak to each other maybe for a month or something um, it, so it, it, and they don't mind either because they're like me so we never send each other pictures of our shoes <laughs> or our dinner or any of that kind of or ask about oh I got a new handbag <laughs> lol <laughs> And I have never used an emoji in my entire life, and I never will. <laughs> just like to tell you that. <laughs> I know some people love, and they all got mad now. There's just like hundreds of these things, pictures after after writing. Like, pff, that's not language. I'm not having that. <laughs> Uh, other people deal with the world. I am Beyonce. I have people who answer the phone and people who answer the door. And I'm very clever at making people do other things for me. Uh, when somebody knocks on the door, even if I'm fully dressed and my partner Keith is in his pyjamas, I will somehow manage to get him to answer the door by pretending that I'm busy doing something else. Uh, and he doesn't know that. <laughs> And he falls for it every single time. And actually, it's just me avoiding answering the door because it freaks the hell out of me. I don't know who it is. I don't know what they'll want. I will end up agreeing to something. That's my fear of telephones and my fear of doors is that I'm not quick enough to say no. Uh, I will end up going, oh, yes, lovely. Thank you. Wonderful. Yes. Sir. Oh, look, love. I have bought Avon makeup. I bought Avon makeup. I don't know. Um, I have very pre precision, far future planning life, um, which kind of worries me a little bit. Part of that's just about the nature of my job, is that I get booked to do things many, many months in advance, um, and, and therefore my diary is quite fixed. Um, but I, my, my schedules and my routines and things are incredibly important to me, and they give me calm. I, I look at my diary and my calendars um, sometimes for hours and hours at a time. It's a very calming thing to be able to think about what, what the days coming up are, are going to be, to be made of. Um, I have lots of very fixed behaviours around food and clothes and roots and work and all of those kind of things, which we'll talk about in a, in a second. Um, and I have a quite a low arousal environment of my life when I don't work. I live in the middle of a forest. Um, I have no one around me, no neighbours, no people. I don't see anyone sometimes for five or six weeks at a time. Um, so I come out here, freak myself out for a couple of weeks and run back away to the forest. I'm going back there on Friday. And I'm not counting the days at all. Um, and my job plays to my strengths. Um, words were my thing. I, I've always written. I've always performed. I've always talked. Um, and so I've managed to find something that kind of works. So on many, many, many areas, it's not just work. It's not just social. It's everything kind of fitting uh, as, as much as, as possible. And when things go wrong, 
there's always a debrief. There's always a, what do we do? Why was there a meltdown? I still have absolutely phenomenally huge meltdowns. Huge. Um, distressing, painful, awful. Infrequent, but when they're big, they're big. And I think a lot of the reason they get so big is because I'm not very good at recognising when they're getting big. So I'm going, yeah, it's fine, yeah, it's fine, yeah, it's fine, boom, and then off it goes, which I think is, is a fairly common thing for lots of people. But I'm constantly trying, what did we do wrong? How did it get to this stage? What, what did we miss? Was there just too much? Did I say yes to too many things? Do I need somebody to say no on my behalf? All of that kind of stuff. It never entirely kind of goes away. So that's just a little bit of, uh, a bit of stuff uh, about me. Um, so I, I thought I'd just kind of talk about some scheduling things. I know, I know Bill's going to talk about kind of executive functioning and that sort of stuff. I think there's a tendency. I, I look like a kind of super nerdy, highly efficient person. And the reason I am is because I'm not. It is that I have to have this huge amount of structure. And I know that some people find it enormously difficult to put that structure in place but for me, if I, if I don't, then I'm, I'm, my functioning reduces by, I don't know, 80% probably. Um, at the moment, we've been decorating our flat and things are in the wrong places. And I've realised that I have done nothing uh, for, for days and days and days. I, I literally just sit. And that's just because I can't find the printer or I can't find the cupboard or, or something that if those structures are not there visually and physically, then actually my functioning completely and utterly disappears um, in a far more extreme way than, than would be apparent, um, you know, given, given the fact that I'm standing here talking in front of you. Um, I like multiple schedules. So I have a calendar, a diary, and I have one of these. Um, this is something, you know, a shop, do you have a shop called Tiger here? Kind of like mini ikea -y kind of a shop. They used to um, do a, a yearly calendar. It was two quid. And it just looked like this, just, just a weekly boxes, just a big pad. Um, and it had the months and the, and the dates and the days. Um, and last year they stopped doing them. And that, sh I was shot to pieces. So I made my own. Um, so it's literally just a box on a piece of paper and you print them out. Um, for me, this is better than a diary. You can have three or four of these going at, at a time if you've got lots of things going on and then you can see them all. You can delegate tasks. So rather than them all spinning round and round in your head, you put them somewhere else and you forget about them. Um, and for me, this is probably my best and most precious thing these days to physically know where I'm going to be. If it all gets messy, which it does very frequently, this is my other favourite thing. This is a Tipex pen thing. So you can get rid of things and cover them up because it all gets a bit scribbly and a bit messy. When it gets really bad, I have stickers that are so big that they cover up everything. Does anybody else do this? That have sort of crazy, scribbly, changeable, and you look at it and you just think, oh, I can't cope with that. So, so getting rid of it and starting again uh, is very, very part of that uh, importance to me. Part of this for me is also, and you might be able to see that there are these little straight lines. They are free periods of time. They are times that I don't have anything specific to be doing. And they are important. And I, I write the times and I write how many hours I have and try and work out how long individual tasks will take to see what I can fit into those spaces. If I can't fit a whole task into a space, I find it very hard to even begin it because I know I'll have to stop before the end. Um, I'm not good at grabbing half an hour to do a bit of a bigger task. I need the whole space to, to be able to do the whole thing. So it's really just stuff that you probably kind of know already, but kind of making it more formalised and thinking, OK, so I'm going to sit here for the next hour because this task is going to take two hours. Well, what, what can I do in that hour? What, what can I, do I just relax? Do I just enjoy myself? Whatever that might be. I can't live life fluidly and go with the flow. I can't bear flexible people who just kind of manage to do I'm, In fact, I'm in awe of them. Um, I'm not able to do that. So my, my little schedules are, are extremely, extremely important. Um, and the delegating of things into the future really helps me not to get overwhelmed by everything because I think sometimes it, it, it can it can do so uh, and so therefore might might be uh, be, be useful uh, traveling I travel a huge amount um, Google Maps is my best friend 
If Google Maps says that somewhere is there it is, then I will follow blindly Google Maps. I could be taken off the edge of the earth by Google Maps. Um, I'm so re reliant on it. And so for me, making sure I have my phone and it being charged up uh, is enormously important. Um, I also take a lot of photographs of uh, maps, instructions. If I go into a building with lots of floors and lots of instructions, I take a photograph of it because once, by the time I've got to the first flight of stairs, I will have completely forgotten where I am and where I'm going. I cannot process verbal instructions at all. I absolutely need it to be visual. If it has to be verbal instructions, I record them on my phone so that I can again play that back. Um, I just don't cope well with those very small things um, that we just have to kind of do all the time, finding your way in, into buildings. Um, I'm frequently lost inside buildings because um, buildings often look the same. This building looks the same, all the doors are the same colour, they've all got blue and white stickers on, the handles are the same. Um, I'm very easily disorientated. If I come out of the loo, loos um, have lots of doors when you come out of the loo. There's the male loo, and especially in restaurants and things like that. You're often in a little kind of foyer. There'll be a broom cupboard. There'll be the exit. There'll be the men's toilets. There'll be somewhere else, a fire exit or something. Um, nine times out of ten, I end up in the men's toilets. And that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Um, so that level of disorientation, I remember seeing um, uh, Zafi, what's Zafi's surname? Simone, I think. Zafi Simone? No? Uh, she's a, she's a, a, an autistic woman, a speaker, and, and her saying that she was once in a, in a public toilet and just completely lost where she was um, and just became absolutely terrified, just just having no idea where you are in the world at all. Um, and that sort of sense of kind of disassociating, just absolute disorientation is, is a really familiar feeling. As something as simple as going to the loo in a restaurant can, can be this humongously kind of stressful experience. Um, and so for me, when I go into buildings, I have a tendency to walk backwards so that I can try and get some kind of mental picture about what it looks like on the way out. Um, because what it looks like on the way out is a complete reverse of what it looks like on the way in. And if you're not great at sequencing and picking up these things, um, so if I'm often shown places, I'm to be seen constantly looking over my shoulder. So many of these things make me look quite strange. But I would rather look strange than be scared, which is my general experience uh, of not being able to, to kind of make, make sense uh, of, of those, those sorts of things. Um, Staying away from home, again, which I do a lot and which you have to perhaps do if you're on holiday and things like that. I know some people find earplugs very difficult. I find the silicon ones much better. These kind of don't go uh, intrusively quite so much in your ear. Always take your own cutlery. This is a spork. It's not any spork. It's a titanium spork. <laughs> um, and it has a little box to go in as well. I never travel anywhere without cutlery and Tupperware and my own tea bags and my own coffee. Um, and food is enormously important. Um, the, the worry about food, I don't know if anybody else kind of worries about food, I'm, I'm quite affected by certain sorts of food, um, and uh, particularly when I'm working, so it's really important that I have what I need, because if I don't, I'm gonna be hungry, and then I start worrying about being hungry, and worrying about getting dizzy, and worrying about having low blood sugar, and worrying. So it just builds up the anxiety. Um, and so I tend to eat the same food all the time, quite repetitively, um, because it doesn't need a fridge and it doesn't need a cooker, so it's, it's a, simple, a simple thing. Always have water, always have my stuff with me, so every single where I go I've always got this, this, this little preparation uh, kind of pack. Um, and I think, I mean certainly, and I know I'm kind of talking to a, to a largely autistic audience, um, something I always need to say when I'm talking to, often to parents and, and to teachers and professionals is that having more routines doesn't make you more autistic. It actually makes me less autistic, if, if you want to think about it in that way. That the more I don't have to worry about, the more processing capacity I have for the rest of the world. And I think for a lot of parents and a lot of teachers, there is a fear that, that, oh, no, 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 we can't let them have their routines because they'll become rigid. Or, oh, no, no, variety is good for you. We will force you to sit on a different chair. We will force you to drink your tea in a different cup because variety is good for you. Um, and I believe very strongly that that is not the case, that, that we require those 
the things that matter and the things that matter differ for everybody the things that matter to me will be different than the things that matter to you but there are some non-negotiables in life and if those non-negotiables are not maintained I think our capacity just drops entirely I know mine does this morning I had the wrong breakfast uh, it wasn't the best breakfast and it was my fault I, I made a bit of a planning error and I didn't have the right breakfast so I've eaten something which normally I just wouldn't have eaten at all um, and it's definitely affected my anxiety level because I'm worried I'm worried is it going to be okay am I going to be nervous am I going to be dizzy um, and actually so my my flexibility not good <coughs> I would rather have a, a more autistic life, which actually gives me more space and capacity elsewhere. And I think being away from home in whatever capacity, because this a bit of this this sim assimilating, the, the gathering, of the mapping, is difficult. The more familiar things that you have, the less of that you have to do. So if I'm going somewhere, I tend to if I'm going to go and I eat in a restaurant, I will. You know, find out where that is on Google Maps. I will go on. It will probably be a restaurant I've eaten at before. Uh, probably a chain restaurant because I know what I can get. I'll probably have the same food. I can go online. I can look at the menu before I leave. So that the less I have, the less that's new, the more capable I am of, of managing that whole experience and it being a kind of kind of a relatively uh, pleasurable experience. Um, so as many familiar things, whatever matters. If you need a, your own pillow to sleep well, take your own pillow. If, or if it's just your own pillowcase or your own bedding or whatever that is, you know, have the things that you need which for you make you think, yes, I'm home, I'm comfortable. I think we have to have enough of in our environments that feels familiar. If every single thing is new, that's just way too much to deal with. It's, it's just too, too complicated and, and, and stressful. Um, so familiarity, I think, and having familiar objects uh, is, is enormously important. Um, so, yeah, and weirdly, I'm going to talk to you about fashion. <laughs> That's never happened before in my entire life. Um, mostly in terms of work kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know if anybody else kind of has, has difficulties with <coughs> working out what the hell you're supposed to wear and how it matches together. Um, I've kind of... I'm, I'm a, I'm, I've moved into... I'm a white stuff lady, Today I'm a Primark lady, but generally I'm a white stuff lady. Um, bit expensive, last forever, don't have to match them with anything. They, they do a lot of these kind of longish, tunicky dresses with really big pockets, which I like. They're not too patterny, um, and they're really comfy, and you can wear them with jeans and leggings, and they don't have to match with anything. Um, I quite often wear dresses, and people say, well, you said you weren't very feminine, but you're wearing a dress. And I say, yes, if you wear a dress, it's one piece of clothing. It has to match with nothing. <laughs> It's not about being feminine, it's about just not wanting to worry whether you're wearing the wrong stuff or, or what, whatever that is. For the vast majority of people and workplaces, in my experience, having had many, many jobs, rarely brushed my hair and not wear makeup, most people don't care. As long as you're clean, as long as you're tidy, as long as you don't stink, then actually it's rare that people are that concerned about those sorts of things. I think when you're younger, you think that they are, but actually they're not. Um, and you don't need to worry too much about these things and just kind of be yourself. And I don't know if anybody else has had this experience who isn't a natural makeup wearer, but repeatedly I have had people over the years say to me, God, you're so lucky you don't have to wear makeup how is that lucky? I just woke up like this. I find it bizarre, but, but actually, and I don't think they're being unkind. I think, I think they believe that that's a sign of confidence. They believe that actually you are brave enough to go out without any makeup on. Whereas I think some women don't feel that way. They, they feel either socially confined or, or in terms of their own confidence that they just couldn't go out without makeup on. So sometimes you might be thinking, well, I don't wear makeup because uh, it's horrible and it's gacky and I don't know how to do it. But on the other side, people are thinking that you're really confident. Isn't that great? Just wing it and go, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you're thinking, me? No, I just don't know how it goes. <laughs> so, yeah, just, just slip under the radar. Uh, people. Oh, that's what I want to say about clothes. If anybody sweats horribly and profusely when they get anxious, pit pads. 
You can buy these online. They're very, very cheap. Generally, I didn't know these existed until a couple of years ago. Uh, I am somebody who ha has, has a lot of adrenaline, a lot of cortisol, and, and uh, perspires an enormous and unpleasant amount. Um, and uh, you, they're very, you buy these on Amazon, uh, and you stick them to your clothing, and they soak up some of the sweat. <laughs> See, practical kind of stuff. Somebody, well, at least one person's going, I'm buying <laughs> I'm not on commission for any of these objects, I'd like you to say. I wish I was. Um, <laughs> uh, something about bras. I just wanted to kind of say that, and I, I, I guess, uh, and, and probably most of you, this, this won't be kind of news to. I, I worked with a young woman once um, who was very, very well endowed in the breast department. Um, very much a feminist, very much her own person, very much... I, I don't want to wear a bra, I don't feel comfortable, it's, it's restrictive, it's painful, I just am not going to do this. Um, I think that's fine, and I think with sensory kind of things, we, we've got to take those things into account. But what the consequence of that was, is that she's walking down the road in T-shirts and those sorts of things. The rest of the world have a perception of someone like that and it's not a good one. And so she attracted all sorts of attention that she didn't want and she didn't, didn't, was, was very puzzled by. And I think that's really hard on lots of levels. One is, why can't I just be me? Why can't I just do what I want to do? I'm comfortable like this, it's fine. But that's not the world we live in. The world we live in makes judgments about young women who go around very obviously uh, not, not wearing bras. And I think we have to protect those young women uh, and, and make sure that you understand the consequences of your actions and maybe think about the clothing that you wear if you don't want that attention. If you don't care, then go for it. But it, it, it might be harmful uh, in, in some kind of situation. So I don't think life's quite as simple as we'd like it to be sometimes. It, you know, it's like, well, what harm am I doing to anybody? Well, none. But society has its own ideas of what a braless young woman might, might, might look like. And she was just wearing kind of quite see-through T-shirts and stuff like that. Then maybe you need to change clothes, which is annoying and frustrating that you should change at all. Um, but, you know, we live in a particular society and I guess we have to protect ourselves uh, in, in that. Uh, wanting to be alone and feeling intensely lonely at the same time uh, seems to be a fairly common paradox for quite a lot of us. Um, I met a lady, she was 83 when she had her diagnosis, um, and she was so lonely, um, intensely, intensely lonely. Um, and she said, I know the solution, but I can't bear the solution. Um, and I think that was something that certainly I could relate to and certainly other people I've sort of spoken to. It's this weird kind of feeling of wanting to be with people but not being able to stand being with people at the same time. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I think that's just one of those things that, that we just have to get our heads around sometimes. Um, an intense feeling of wanting to belong but not knowing where you belong. Um, and, and that, for me, is, has been a lifelong kind of search. Uh, my partner, Keith, who, who's also autistic, just doesn't have that. He's absolutely happy on his own, just with me, with our family. That's it. He doesn't need anything else. And he just sees me constantly looking for something, looking for a community, looking to fit somewhere and continually failing to be able to kind of do so. Um, so I, if, you, if you're younger than me and you're still doing that, just stop. Because it really, you know, find your people, find your tribe, find small numbers of people that you get on with um, and, and stop that kind of search for, I don't know what it is, to be part of something. Uh, I think it's rare for us to find large numbers of people who we, we feel kind of comfortable with. I think if you're one of those people who compares yourself to non-autistic girls and women in any way, please stop doing that as well. You are not like them. And the ones that you're comparing yourself with are likely to be the most neurotypical, popular, glamorous, flexible, fashionable, wonderful women that you can put on a pedestal and go, if I'm not like her, then I'm failing. She's probably airbrushed. She's probably miserable. It, she, you know, it isn't what it appears. Um, Choose, choose role models that are similar. Choose people that you can aspire to. You, you are not going to be that person. That's not who you are. Um, and quite often I talk to young women and I say to them, OK, if you want to be her, you have to give up that passion, that curiosity, the interests, the love of word puzzles, the love of craft, the love of whatever it is that really, really gets you. So that's the deal. You know, deal with the devil. 
If you want to be super neurotypical, you're going to have to give up something of who you are. Do you want to do that deal? And they all say no. So deep down, I think most of us kind of like who we are, but we kind of just wish the world would like it a little bit more as well. Um, I don't want to be different, but I just like someone to think that's okay that I'm that I'm who, who I am. So always remember that if you're aspiring to be something that you're not, what are you willing to give up? You know, really, do you want to give up? Do you want to be that person entirely who doesn't get that joy and passion from <coughs> from those subjects and those things that that you that you love to do? Not everybody will like you, and that's not something to take personally. Um, I remember this being... I was quite late when I worked this out, in my 30s, I think, um, and I was doing internet dating. Um, and I, it just occurred to me that sometimes you're just not going to be somebody's cup of tea, in the same way that some people are just not my cup of tea. And that's not personal. That just don't find you attractive. We have different values. We want different things out of your life, and that's okay. And kind of taking that on as a very conscious thought was really helpful in terms of thinking about feeling rejected, feeling unattractive, feeling unlovable. That actually, not everybody likes everybody. Every pot has its lid, as my friend uh, Fiona is is, is wont to say. Um, And that's okay. And I think that's a kind of useful thing to think. Just because someone doesn't want to be your friend doesn't mean that you're unlikable or unlovable. It just means that that you weren't their kind of thing. And that's, that's fine. The ones that will like you will probably be a bit like you, as I said earlier, that, that it's very typical that similar people find each other along the way, whether that's similar activities, similar values, similar characteristics in some way. So few friends, infrequent duration, uh, meetings of short duration and little uh, maintenance, um, it seems to be the way to go for, for a lot of us in terms of a sort of happy, happy friendships and, and relationship model. Um, universally we are terrible at maintenance every almost every autistic person i meet sometimes they say well i'd love to have more friends and i say well you know the people that you do know do you check in with them do you say oh how are you doing oh you had a you had a bad leg how was your bad leg and they go nah don't do any of that (laughs) you can't have both if you want lots of friends particularly neurotypical friends they need that They need topping up on a continual basis. You cannot have your cake and eat it in this this way. You cannot just turn up when you feel like it and go, hey, you want to do stuff? And they're going, who are you? (laughs) You've not been in touch with me for six months. That's not how it works. You have to be in there topping up, topping up, topping up. Even if you have to write notes to yourself on your phone to remember (coughs) that somebody went for a job interview or it's their birthday or their kid was ill to check in with them. It is not necessarily spontaneous, but if you don't do it, people won't um, remember you and you won't be kind of kind of part of that. That seems to be absolutely universally true. If you can't be bothered with all of that or it's just not on your radar, I forget I have children. I, I'm so poor at maintenance. I have to write notes to myself to contact my own children. My children are adults. Please don't ring safeguarding. They are not tied up in a bench somewhere. Um, They're they're safe. They're fine. We made it together. Um, It just doesn't occur to me. It's a very present world that I live in. Anyone who is not here right now is completely off my radar. I have very little emotions about them. I don't miss people. Um, I theoretically and intellectually know that I love them and that I enjoy spending time with them. But it isn't uh, a feeling, uh, isn't an emotional memory for, for things. And so that makes it quite hard to replicate those things. Um, that if you can't emotionally remember what it might be like to be with those people, there's a tendency to just go, well, actually, you know, no, I'll stay at home. I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll bother. Um, so it's almost having to override that system and say, well, I don't really want to go and see this person. But if there, I do know that I have enjoyed it in the past, and it's almost having to do it anyway, just to, because you kind of trust your own judgment that you, you will enjoy it when you get there. But that emotional excitement and motivation to go and see them might not necessarily be there. So I think sometimes we have to override our own systems. Uh, anxiety is probably the biggest and worst element of autism uh, for me. Um, luckily, I have my own weapon, which is stubbornness. Uh, and stubbornness and anxiety are constantly at war with each other. 
Unfortunately, with the pre-menopause setting in, uh, setting in uh, anxiety has brought a new weapon to uh, fight the war, and that's panic attack. Um, so that's something that I've been experiencing more and more frequently. Um, not fun. Anxiety, not fun at all. Um, I think it's important, and I, I see it a lot of the time, I think a lot of people are very scared of anxiety. A lot of professionals, a lot of parents, or people are worried about it. Um, and they wrap their kids up in cotton wool. Um, and as one of the feral autistic generation, nobody did that to me. They, nobody gave me any sympathy. They just told me to crack on and get out there. Um, and it's been horrible. Um, but I'm very grateful because I can do a lot more things than I see a lot of younger autistic people being able to do because they've been told to listen to that anxiety and I don't listen to mine most of the time. I, it's a head-on kind of battle. Most of the things you ever worried about have never happened. The way for me to deal with anxiety is through logic and evidence. So I, it's all CBT kind of stuff. It's self-talk. Okay, this is a thing, right? I'm having a panic attack. I'm freaking out. Is anybody else freaking out in the room where I am? No, they're not. Okay, that probably means that there isn't anything to freak out about. Therefore, this is not real. It's hard work. Anybody who's kind of done this stuff, and I'm sure many, many of you have, is hard work. It's constantly having to kind of try and show yourself that actually this is a waste of your energy to do this. Um, there, for me, there is no answer to this. I will always be an anxious person. I accept that. And I think the acceptance of it is, is part of the battle, the part of winning the battle. Zero anxiety, I think, in most autistic people is completely unrealistic. I wouldn't even bother aiming for it. Um, because you'll constantly feel disappointed in yourself, you'll constantly feel like you're failing. Um, there's a presentation on YouTube that I've done on, on anxiety, um, which kind of explains all of this, why I think autistic people have a right to be anxious, should be anxious, are rationally anxious. It, it makes sense to be so. Um, and I, and I, think, I think it's just a matter of just going, okay, so you've turned up today, right, come on then, we're going out anyway. And as much as possible, finding ways to just do things anyway. The alternative is that you just sit and you live your life and nothing happens and you just were scared. You could just go out and be scared and do stuff anyway, and, and maybe that may be a different way to live. I mean, obviously people have their own ability to, to overcome this kind of stuff, and, and I appreciate that that's very much a, a, a personal experience. Um, what I am aware of is that I get anxious about things that don't need to be anxious about, and, and I think that requires effort to, to work your way through it. I see it as almost like being a smoke alarm that keeps going off when you're making toast. So it's become oversensitive over the years. It, it triggers itself to, for things that, that shouldn't necessarily need, need trigger, triggering for. Um, I also know that I have a tendency to ruminate on tiny things that I've got wrong, which happen frequently. Other people move on from this stuff incredibly quickly. They don't remember at all. So you might bring it up and go, oh, I'm so sorry, I did that thing. And they go, what, did you? It really doesn't matter to them. So I guess that's about making things the size they should be. For you, it might be 100%. For them, it might be one, and it's passed. So it, don't spend more of your time than you need to worrying about things that you don't need to. Other people are not doing that. It, 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 you, you haven't been as awful as you think that you have been uh, generally. Uh, shrinking, feeding. Some people give their anxiety or, or their stress a name. Some people... Um, imagine it being a kind of beast some people draw it whatever you need to do it, it might just be that it's that it's kind of part of your life uh, and if you need medication take medication you know if, if something helps you to kind of do what you need to do then I, I think that's a that's a, an, an important important thing to do so what would have helped if I had known uh, earlier about all of this? I think the big thing is knowing that I was all right as I was. And I guess that's my kind of message to you. You're all right as you are. Um, you're, you're no better, no worse than anybody else out there. Um, and if, if that's all you know, then, then that's good enough, really. You're not defective. You're not wrong. Yeah, you make mistakes. But, you know, you live in a world full of people that aren't quite like you. So it's to be expected that you'll, you'll make errors somewhere along the way. The desperation to be liked and the desperation to try and fit in uh, socially um, 
made me incredibly vulnerable. Um, a, a mentor, a buddy, somebody keeping an eye on the kind of relationships that I was having, that would have really helped me um, around sort of sexual information, around motivations of other people that I just didn't get. I just believed them. If they said they liked me, okay, you like me, great, let's go. Um, and put myself in lots of very dangerous situations um, that, that mentally were not good and physically were not good. <coughs> Knowing that being clever doesn't protect you, that everybody thought that it would be okay because I was clever, not being able to read those agendas of other people, uh, not just in terms of relationships or predatory people, but also just in terms of friendships or work relationships, that often other people have an agenda. And if you don't know what they are or you don't have one yourself, it tends to be you that gets trodden on along the way. So someone that could navigate that, somebody that could say, well, actually, they're only doing that because they want promotion, that would have been really useful for me to know that. I, I will never know that, that kind of stuff, uh, and that, that was, was difficult. Knowing that I can do more, less and more than other people, I can do a lot less than other people when it's indoors, when there's a sensory element to it, when there are lots of unstructured people related things to it, my capacity <coughs> is very small and pointless things. I'm not good at, at doing what I consider to be pointless things. If there's focus, if there's structure, if there's something with a linear outcome, if it's something physical, I can do more than other people. I can do hours and hours and hours more than other people. And knowing that profile, I mean, we talk about it in autism as being this spiky profile, but what that actually means in your life, not just a kind of theoretical model, but what does it mean to be good and strong and fired up when you're doing certain things and then depleted and exhausted and drained when you're doing other things? And it, it seems often that it's the things that I find easy are the things that other people find difficult and vice versa. So how do you live in a world where you're just on fire in certain areas and, and in other things just going to a pub or having a tea break are just impossible, they're excruciating, they're just, I can't be here. Knowing that about yourself I think is so important in terms of making decisions about yourself. It doesn't mean that you say no to everything that's uncomfortable, it means that you try to manage those sorts of things. Okay, so I need to go to a meeting, I need to go to a family party. How do I best manage that? Do I go late? Do I go early? Do I find myself a job to do? Can I, can I do the washing up? Can I hand the food out? Can, can I be functional and useful in some way which allows me to be seen and to mingle but not in that awkward, unstructured uh, kind of a fashion? I know that I have, I have family who want to come and stay and come and visit and in my head it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be like Nigella Lawson's family. We're going to drink Prosecco and eat sun-dried tomatoes. And in my head, we're all laughing and hugging and we're all beautiful. But most of my family's autistic and it's not like that. We're awkward and most of them are gluten-free or they can't eat this or, or something. And it's, it's uncomfortable. And within 24 hours, I'm in the bedroom crying, going, when are they leaving? <laughs> And it's me that invited them and said, come and stay for a week, come and stay for a week, because I can't imagine what that will be like. It feels so exciting at the time, but the reality of it is completely undoable. So what we do now is if people come and stay for a few days, I plan a day in the middle where I make up something that I'm busy doing. So we say, look, you know, come along, but on Wednesday, um, we just need to go and, and you know, go and do some other stuff. I've got some work to do or something. And my partner and I will disappear. And what that allows me to do is to get to the peak of my capacity. And just as I'm sliding down, I get a break. And then I can come back in at the end of the day or whatever. And they're happy. They're okay. They can look after themselves, my visitors. And then I can do a little bit more. And then they go home. So these small things, you don't have to mention autism. You don't have to talk about not being able to cope because sometimes people take that personally. All you have to do is, is just put in what you need um, and, and people accept it quite often. But it's knowing what you need allows you to kind of be a bit of a trickster and, and, and put these things in place. I want to be a good person. I want these person, people to come and see me. I want to enjoy their company. 
So it's not about having them all the time. And it's not about never having them. It's about having them on my terms a little bit, which doesn't kind of harm them. And I guess that's what I've sort of tried to do with most of my life, is to do the things I can, understand the limitations, and try to avoid the things that, that I'm not so good at uh, as, as, much as, I, as much as I possibly can. Because we're incredible and amazing, we're not influenced by other people. I, I still run up down escalators at the age of 49. Uh, I still don't brush my hair. I still don't wear makeup. I basically do what I like most of the time. I'm fortunate I'm self-employed. I can pick and choose a little bit, and I'm very appreciative that that's not, not the way it is. Um, I went to Greece, and I pruned 50 olive trees, and that's me with my bonfire. Uh, we're different. We're formidable. We're opinionated. Um, we, we can be incredible things if we actually kind of take up the space that we deserve in the world. Um, we're not constrained by gender, by peers, by other stuff. You, you are an amazing bunch of people and, and don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Um, and you're perfectly fine exactly as you are. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.